British bombers fly overhead. The skeleton crew of Nazi soldiers scramble for cover. Bombs fall from the sky, landing inches away from the Germans, but they do not explode. After the coast is clear, the Germans leave their shelter to investigate. Lying on the ground next to their decoy planes is a wooden bomb. Written on the side are the words wood for wood. During World War II, it was common to build decoy tanks, airplanes, and bridges to fool the opposing side into thinking there were forces located where they really weren't. This was done so the opposition would waste time and resources trying to destroy the decoys. There was one fake Nazi base that's gone down in history. It was an elaborate airfield constructed of wood located just outside of Amsterdam. The airbase was discovered and targeted by the British Royal Air Force bombers, but their mission wasn't to destroy the fake airbase. Instead of actual bombs, the pilots dropped wooden replicas with snide remarks written on the sides. So, why did the RAF drop fake wooden bombs on a fake Nazi airbase? The reason is so crazy, it'll make you laugh. As war raged on in Europe, the Nazis built a number of decoy bases to try and trick Allied forces. Unfortunately, this tactic worked on more than one occasion, leading the Allies into ambushes or wasting their resources on targets that had no strategic value. However, in this one particular situation, the British played the Nazis for fools. The Nazi soldiers and engineers meticulously built an entire airbase made of wood. This project took several weeks, and during the building phase, the Nazis did their best to hide the true nature of the decoy from the RAF reconnaissance planes. The plan was to trick Allied intelligence into thinking there was an important facility being built into the forests of Germany, when in reality there wasn't. Their mission succeeded in getting the attention of the RAF. Planes were sent over the area to verify that the Germans had indeed built a base there. From the sky, it looked like the airbase was fully stocked and operational. The Nazis had built hangars, oil tanks, and anti-aircraft guns, and planes all made of wood. Although many of the structures looked real from the sky, they were just empty shells meant to throw off the Allies. The Nazis believed their hard work had paid off when the RAF planes flew over more frequently. It was only a matter of time until the British Air Force wasted pilots, money, and resources on destroying their fake airbase. Surprisingly, almost immediately after completing the decoy, the RAF made their move. A bomber took a run on a decoy base. The Germans dove for cover, expecting their hard work to go up in a fiery explosion. But to their surprise, all they heard were dull thuds as objects landed in the muddy, fake airfield without any sort of explosion. When the Nazi soldiers went to examine the payload that the RAF plane had released, they were shocked. The objects that had all been dropped from the bomber were fake wooden bombs. The British had known all along that the Nazis were building a decoy airbase. They had waited until the Germans had completed their ruse and then made them aware that it had fooled no one. The Nazis were now the ones who wasted their time and resources as no Allied planes would drop actual bombs and no troops would be sent in to try and destroy their fake airbase. The British had embarrassed the Nazis with their wooden bombs. But why did the Royal Air Force partake in such escapades? Why didn't they just ignore the base altogether? And what anecdotal evidence actually exists about the wooden bombs? There are hundreds of testimonies from both sides of the war about the wooden bombing of the decoy airbase. Although it was embarrassing, even former Nazi soldiers recount the event with mild amusement. At the time, Werner Thiel was a Luftwaffe pilot who saw the dropping of the wooden bombs. In October of 1943, he was given orders to move decoy wooden aircraft around a fake airfield and turn light beacons on to make it look like the base was active. The Nazi commanders had received word that there was an incoming RAF bombing run. This is what Thiel and his comrades had been waiting for. They were about to trick the Allied forces. Thiel recounts having dozens of fake wooden planes that were sheathed in canvas and held together by ropes. As the RAF bomber flew overhead, Thiel took cover. When he was given the all clear, he was shocked to find six to ten bombs on the floor made of quality solid wood with wood for wood written on them. The Nazis were astonished. Not in a million years did they think the Allies were onto their plan. They were sorely mistaken. In fact, Lieutenant Commander Thiel even said later in an interview that he and his Nazi brothers thought it was meant as a joke, something like, look how stupid you are. You built a dummy airfield. We saw it, and it's not worth dropping a real bomb. Basically, the British just wanted to embarrass the Nazis by letting them know they were onto them all along. These fake bombs were most likely the result of young pilots trying to make their Nazi adversaries feel silly. It's important to remember that at the time, many of the pilots and soldiers fighting in World War II were in their early 20s or late teens. But even if it wasn't just a way to embarrass the Nazis, using wooden bombs allowed the British pilots to inform their adversaries that they had been bested. You may be wondering where these fake bombs came from and were British pilots wasting time making them? The answer is the wooden bombs were just kind of laying around. They were created to be used in training missions and were identical in shape to the real bombs dropped on Axis forces. However, since they were carved out of wood, they cost significantly less than the real thing. Since the war in Europe had been raging on, there wasn't a ton of time to train new recruits, so the bombs sat idly by. The RAF pilots who spotted their fake airbase might have thought the training bombs could be put to good use by embarrassing the Nazis. British intelligence also might have been in on the joke, as it was reported by an American journalist that the communications from British intelligence in Holland had identified a fake airbase that contained over 100 dummy planes made of wood. British intelligence would have informed the RAF of 
what had been discovered and may have hinted at letting the Nazis know they hadn't been fooled. Whether the wooden bombs were the idea of some young British pilots who wanted to embarrass the Nazis or British intelligence wanting to show they couldn't be bested, one thing is for sure. The British felt that a wooden air base deserved wooden bombs. To be fair, there are no official reports of the wooden bombs being used on the decoy air base, but this isn't surprising. If it were just a joke being played on the Nazis, the British pilots were still taking a huge risk flying into enemy airspace. They also would be using a bomber and vital fuel that might have been put to better use by bombing a real target. Therefore, the bombing run on the decoy base was probably not sanctioned by the high command of the Allied forces. But this wasn't the only example of decoys being built to fool the enemy in World War II. There are numerous accounts across Europe and even in the Pacific of fake bases, vehicles, and armies being constructed to fool the opposition. There are accounts of fake airmen being dropped into enemy territory to trick them into moving units away from areas that Allied forces were actually trying to get to. This tactic was most famously used during the D-Day landing, when paradummies were dropped to trick the Germans into moving troops away from the actual incursion zone. This helped Allied forces to capture key points on the French coast, while the Nazis were scratching their heads as to why the fake paratroopers were not firing back. One of the most common forms of decoys in World War II were inflatables. Both the Axis and Allied powers would use inflatable tanks, artillery guns, and even bridges to fool the enemy. A favorite inflatable decoy during the Second World War were rubber tanks. These balloon vehicles were the size of actual tanks, except they were made of rubber, air, and some scaffolding. There was even a division of the military that specialized in creating such decoys. The inflatable tanks were easy to assemble and take down. Once they were deflated, the materials could fit into a duffel bag and be transported to the next location as needed. Once the soldiers were ready to deploy the decoys, the inflatable tanks were taken out of their bags, pumped full of air from a generator, and were good to go. This whole process could be completed in 20 minutes, which meant that in that amount of time, an army could double its size, or at least that's how it would appear to the enemy. Inflatables were so successful that in 1940, Allied forces used 100 fake airfields and around 400 decoy aircraft to trick the Nazis into bombing fake targets. In a bombing run on August 4th, the Luftwaffe sent three waves of bombers to destroy the fake air bases. This kept an actual military factory from being targeted, and the real structure was almost completely unharmed during the bombing run. In the Pacific Theater during World War II, the Japanese were masters of creating decoys. They would use straw to create fake planes that tricked Allied attackers into spending their ammunition on decoy targets. The Japanese forces would also use inflatable tanks and artillery guns to throw off the Allies. When there was no other resources available, the Japanese would even make decoy vehicles out of volcanic ash that was sticking out of the ground. The rock was soft and easy to sculpt using nothing but a knife. It wasn't until modern-day surveillance and reconnaissance technology that decoys became all but obsolete. Now, with high-resolution images that can be taken with satellites and drones, inflatable tanks and wooden airfields are a thing of the past. It's just days before Operation Overlord, better known in the history books as D-Day. Over one million men from five different nations will simultaneously launch several landings across the French coast, a military operation the likes of which has never been attempted before. Waiting across the English Channel are several hundred thousand German defenders, sitting in heavily fortified bunkers, overseeing beaches littered with mines, barbed wire, and concrete tank traps. Hitler and his generals know that an invasion is coming. Up until now, the war has been largely Britain fighting for her life, with the Soviets in the Far East being easily defeated. The Americans have conducted several operations in Northern Africa with very mixed success, but now the bulk of their forces are finally in Britain, eager to join the fight. Any day now, the true battle of Europe will begin, and the Germans hold all the advantages. Suddenly, German radio operators begin picking up radio chatter from American and British units. The operators are quick to identify several of the Allied units broadcasting, including several American and British infantry divisions, armored divisions, and even General Patton's headquarters itself. The alarm is immediately raised. Something big is going down, and soon. The Luftwaffe is ordered to put recon planes up into the air, and as they make the short trip across the channel, they take photos of column after column of tanks, trucks, and artillery, all lined up and ready to board landing craft. German Army headquarters is immediately alerted to the pending invasion, and General Rommel himself orders reinforcements to rush to Calais, directly across from the preparing invaders. He even commits the bulk of his armor reserve to the area. The Allies must not be allowed to gain so much as a toehold on Europe. They must be met directly on the beach and thrown back into the ocean. Another reconnaissance flight over the massing forces is ordered, and the pilot confirms the locations of the Allied forces, reporting thousands of armored vehicles and trucks waiting to be loaded. As the plane turns around from overflying the mass troops, a stiff wind suddenly picks up, and one of the tanks starts to float away. 
Hurrying, a soldier ducks out from under a tent and rushes to the tank, tying it down with a rope and securing it from the stiff breeze. Luckily, the German plane seems to have taken no notice of the peculiar incident. As Germany prepares to defeat the largest invasion in military history, there's just one problem. The American and British tanks and other vehicles are all made of rubber, barely more than inflatable balloons. The giant invasion army is fake, a ploy engineered by the British and carried out with the help of the US's 23rd Headquarters Special Troops. And the real invasion force is massing right now for a landing dozens of miles away in Normandy, known as the Ghost Army. The 23rd Headquarters Special Troops was a military outfit like no other. Its members were men specifically recruited from the world of advertisement, visual arts of all sorts, carpenters, and talented actors. Their job was simple, fool the Germans by pretending to be something they were not, and the 1100-strong unit was tasked with staging elaborate displays that would make the Germans believe they were facing a much larger threat than they really were. Making use of inflatable tanks, rubber airplanes, and plywood artillery, officially known as tactical deception, this elite troop of soldiers would be critical in confusing and confounding the German military throughout the course of the war. The Ghost Army ultimately staged 20 battlefield deceptions between 1944 and 1945. Their performances or illusions, as the members insisted on calling their cunning tricks, would often take place within just a few hundred yards of enemy lines, putting them in just as much risk as any regular soldier. Yet unlike regular soldiers, if the enemy didn't fall for the trick, they might be left with nothing more than rubber tanks to fight with. In order to fool the Germans, the Ghost Army created something called Atmosphere, a term familiar to any theater or film artist. In essence, atmosphere simply means creating a believable tone or impression for the audience, and in this case, the audience was German military units and undercover spies. To do this, the members of the Ghost Army would wear uniforms from different military units and make sure they were seen marching by enemy scouts. The scouts would then return back to their headquarters and report that members of a specific unit were operating in the local area. While the real unit, along with all its firepower, was in actuality somewhere else entirely. This would lead the Germans to deploy their forces to defend from imaginary threats, fearing for instance an attack by an American armored division, when in reality that same division was preparing to attack somewhere else far away. To help sell the illusion though, the soldiers of the Ghost Army would drive trucks or tanks, sometimes as few as just two, in constant looping convoys, creating the illusion of a much larger unit being transported to the front lines. The clever actors would also learn to impersonate radio operators from different units, mimicking not just their voice, but also the way that they sent Morse code messages, down to every minute idiosyncrasy of the specific operator. All these tiny details would add up to a very convincing deception, leaving the Germans utterly confused as to the real state of affairs across the combat front. Ghost Army soldiers would also put their acting talents to use in person, often spending time at French cafes near the war front, where they knew they would be overheard by German spies. The soldiers would wear uniforms of different infantry or armored divisions, again sowing confusion as to the true location of the real units, and they would talk loudly and openly about upcoming tactical operations. Commensurate actors, the Ghosters would learn their roles well, playing everything from overexcited new recruits eager to see their first combat and accidentally spilling operational secrets, to even high-ranking generals bragging about upcoming operations to pretty waitresses, while knowing that a German spy would certainly be within earshot. Sometimes though, it was just enough to be seen and not heard, and soldiers would often parade around pretending to be very high-ranking Allied officers, making German spies believe that major operations must be about to take place in areas where no such operations were being planned. If you've ever acted in a school play and thought it was nerve-wracking, imagine trying to play the part of a very high-ranking officer in World War II, knowing that your performance could save or doom thousands of lives. Ghost Army soldiers used every range of their artistic talent in the fight to liberate Europe, and this included audio engineers. Today, you might hold yourself up in a room with some music software and cook up some sick beats to get a few likes on Facebook. But for the soldiers of the Ghost Army, creating convincing mixtapes made up of the sounds of different vehicles and tanks could mean the difference between life and death. These soldiers worked in conjunction with Bell Labs back in Fort Knox and recorded dozens of different types of military vehicles, everything from tanks to trucks and even jeeps. The recordings were written directly into wire recorders, bleeding edge technology at the time, and then transported to the battlefields of Europe. 
A modern DJ may have to mix different tracks together to entertain an audience, but in World War II, the Ghost Army's own DJs would be tasked with mixing all the different recordings of armored vehicles to create a realistic soundscape of an advancing army. If the recordings or the mixing just wasn't right, the entire ploy could collapse, and Ghost Army soldiers had to do this with primitive equipment mounted on the back of a half-track loaded with giant speakers. No doubt a difficult task. The tactic was nevertheless effective in fooling the Germans several times, and the recordings could be heard as far away as 15 miles, giving the impression of a very large force moving through the thick woods of Europe's forests. Another brainchild of the Ghost Army was spoof radio, and it used actors impersonating radio operators from other units. They would do everything from report fake troop movements to even calling in fake radio reports from imaginary combat zones complete with a soundscape of battlefield noises to make the performance believable. Thus, German units might be fooled into thinking that American forces were retreating by picking up the broadcast of a panicked soldier calling for a retreat, when in actuality the forces were digging in to lure the Germans into a trap or weren't even in the area at all. The fake battlefield broadcasts also confused the Germans, making them believe that their own units, which were not engaged in battle, had been engaged. Confused German commanders would be forced to contact individual units to try and clear the fog of war, leaving opportunities for Allied troops to act before the Germans could properly react. Spoof radio was so successful that it even fooled Axis Sally, otherwise known as Mildred Gillers, an American woman turned Nazi propagandist. She would go on to report that an entire Allied division was preparing for battle at a place with no troops at all. Ghost Army soldiers would often protect other soldiers in a much more active way though. During D-Day and several other major operations, Ghost Army artists created realistic looking decoys that became tempting bombing and artillery targets for the Germans. This would include artillery emplacements, fake landing barges, and groups of parked vehicles. The elaborate displays would sometimes even be lit up with lights, as if someone was being accidentally careless, making them that much more tempting for the Germans to strike at. Attacks on these fake military positions saved countless Allied lives. Sometimes though, ghost soldiers would simply mirror pre-existing positions, such as artillery sites, diverting fire from the real emplacement, and once more, saving lives. As the fight for Europe moved to the east, so too did the Ghost Army. In September after the D-Day landings, the Ghost Army impersonated the entirety of the 6th Armored Division, effectively plugging a gap in General Patton's assault on the French city of Metz. German forces looked for a vulnerability to exploit and instead were faced with a continuous line of American forces, leaving them no room to outmaneuver the American advance. Had the Germans not fallen for the ruse, they would certainly have broken through the American lines and flanked the real attack by General Patton, potentially dooming the entire assault. Imagine being the German general who would learn later after the war that rubber tanks were what defeated him in one of the pivotal battles for Europe. Yet, as impressive as the Ghost Army's deceptions were up to this point, one of their greatest illusions would take place toward the end of the war. In March 1945, Allied forces were preparing to cross the Rhine River, and at last into the heart of Germany itself. Victory was within sight, if they could just get across the very heavily fortified Rhine. Any attempt to cross would be bloody, with casualties projected in the tens of thousands, and yet the attack was necessary to finally bring an end to World War II. The Ghost Army would play their part in the attack, and were tasked with the incredible job of simulating two entire infantry divisions, or about 20,000 men and all their equipment, with just 1,100 soldiers. The Ghost Army would set upon the impossible task with gusto, calling on every ounce of artistic creativity to fool the Germans into believing the main assault across the Rhine would come far away from the actual attack. To do this, they ran a mounting concert of radio broadcasts, simulating troop movements and orders between different brigade and division commanders, a performance that convinced the Germans real units were moving into the area. Across the river, the Ghost Army blasted its carefully mixed soundtrack of troops, vehicles, and heavy equipment, making sentries posted along the Rhine believe that just across the river from them, the illusionary divisions were preparing for an attack. The deceit worked perfectly, and incredibly, when the real American units made their crossing of the Rhine, they encountered little, if any, resistance, laying bare Germany's heart. 
The Ghost Army is credited with saving tens of thousands of lives and helping ensure victory in World War II. Its soldiers were certainly cut from a different cloth, being professional and amateur actors, painters, and artists of all sorts, and bringing their incredible talents to their nation's aid in one of the darkest times in modern history. Their contribution to victory, however, is likely best immortalized in the results of the D-Day invasions, when even as the main assault force was making landfall in Normandy, the Germans refused to send reinforcements, believing the real attack to be a diversion for the fake attack by rubber tanks waiting for them across the channel. In 1942, the Allies had a serious problem. Germany was believed to be moving full steam ahead on its program to create a nuclear weapon, and the Russian front was increasingly looking like a lost cause. Something had to be done, and fast, or the war might soon be lost. That something would be the creation of the US's first special forces force. Norway was of great strategic importance to Germany as it gave them access to iron and other minerals needed for the war effort, but also to heavy water facilities, which were used in their nuclear weapons program. Further, their control of Norway prevented the Allies from having an easy year-round route to Russia, which the United States was steadily feeding as many military supplies and food as it could fit into cargo ships. Without this aid, Russia would collapse under the Nazi onslaught. If the Allies could take Norway, it would open up a direct route to Russia and severely hamper the Nazi war effort. But Norway was easily fortified, and a major assault would be disastrous. Instead, an English intellectual proposed a bold idea, land a small but highly trained and well-equipped force onto the mountain glaciers of Norway, from which they could conduct raids on vital German targets and then retreat back to the safety of their mountain bases. The British High Command thought highly of the idea, but ultimately realized it didn't have the manpower or logistics to pull off such a daring feat. So instead, they kicked the idea over to the Americans. For the Americans, forcing the Nazis out of Norway could spell the end of the European war, something they wanted very much as it would free up the Allies to fight in the Pacific. Plans to land an elite commando force behind enemy lines which would live off the mountains were quickly adopted and the first special service force was born. Recruitment for the FSSF was undertaken via posters at various military bases. The advertisements asked for daring individuals in good physical shape who had experience as mountaineers, skiers, hunters, game wardens, lumberjacks, and the sort. The US wouldn't undertake the effort alone though, and the unit would end up being made up of half Americans and half Canadians. The FSSF would consist of three regiments and one services battalion, with half the officers and one third of the enlisted listed men being Canadian. While remaining members of the Canadian military, all expenses were paid for by the US Army, and the men would wear American uniforms. An American officer was placed in charge of the unit, but a Canadian officer was made second in command. The FSSF training was brutal, even by modern standards. Within 48 hours of arrival at Helena, Montana, chosen for its difficult terrain and cold weather, FSSF recruits would earn their parachutist wings. The men spent nearly a full year in training, with August through October dedicated to parachuting, weapons and demolition usage, small unit tactics, and physical training. October to November was spent on unit tactics and problem solving. November to July consisted of skiing, rock climbing, adaptation to cold climates, and the operation of this specially constructed all-terrain vehicle, the M29 Weasel. Training consisted of not just American and Canadian equipment and tactics, but also the use of German equipment until the men were as proficient with German weapons as they were with their own. They were trained in hand-to-hand -hand combat and bayonet fighting techniques, even sparring against each other with unsheathed bayonets, leading to many injuries. Once the snows fell, Norwegian ski instructors took over and within two weeks, the Americans and Canadians had mastered the basics. The training would continue until their Norwegian instructors were confident the men were up to Norwegian army standards. It was an irregular year unit, which would soon be fighting in highly irregular ways. The FSSF's first combat deployment would be to the Aleutian Islands in 1943. Their winter time and mountain training made them perfect for the Alaskan environment, but upon reaching their destination it was discovered the Japanese had already evacuated the island. The FSSF was then redeployed to Europe, where the possibility of an insertion into Norway had come and gone. Instead, the men would ship off to Italy and join in the stab at Hitler's soft underbelly. Here they would have their baptism by fire, trying to take an objective many Allied troops had lost their lives trying to take. Immediately upon arrival, the FSSF had their mountaineering skills put to the test. The Allied push into Italy was being severely hampered by two strong German defense positions, one at Monte la Defensa and another at Monte la Remetanea. 
Previous assaults on these strongholds had yielded nothing but terrible losses for the Allies. The FSSF would have to prove they could succeed where everyone else had failed. If they didn't, the Allied push to Rome would falter. La Defensa would be the first target to be attacked. On the 2nd of December, the 2nd Regiment was tucked into within six miles of the base of the mountain, after which the men disembarked and moved on foot through the forest. Ahead of them lay a six-hour march, uphill, through difficult terrain, with the hornet's nest full of Nazis waiting for them. A force of 600 men had reached the base of the mountain and took a rest, then under the cover of dusk began their ascent of La Defensa. The assault was covered by a brutal Allied bombardment, with one soldier remarking that it looked as if they were marching into hell, as if the entire mountain was on fire. The men managed to sneak all the way to the base of the final cliff they'd have to climb without the Germans ever realizing they were there. Such was the intensity of the incoming artillery. But Mother Nature helped too, lashing out at all the combatants with freezing rain, which helped cover the approach approaching soldiers as they climbed a thousand-foot cliff, but it also exhausted the men and threatened to blow them off their perilous holds and to a very ugly death on the rocks below. Incredibly, the men climbed to the top of the cliff and then moved into position in a shallow depression just across from the enemy's lines. They were supposed to hold their fire until dawn, when the assault would begin, but the loose gravel giving way under the feet of the soldiers gave their positions away to the Germans. Flares shot into the air, revealing to the utter shock of the defending Germans the 600 Americans and Canadians that had scaled a cliff to reach them. The FSSF put up a fierce battle, and despite Allied commanders expecting that the fighting would last for up to a week, the Germans retreated to their second defensive position in only two hours. Such was the ferocity of the Devil's Brigade attack. Through terrain so treacherous, no regular infantry unit could have managed the feat. The follow-on attack at Monte La Rimatanea had to be briefly halted due to the death of the 1st Battalion Co-Lieutenant Colonel T.C. McWilliam. Instead, the men were ordered to wait for resupply and dug in, expecting a German counterattack at any time. The Germans, however, would be unable to mount a counterattack due to the fierce pounding they received from Allied artillery. The flooding of two nearby rivers also prevented them from regrouping during their retreat, leaving the Nazis off balance and allowing British forces to break through German lines at Monte Camino. With the British breakthrough, the FSSF continued to attack on La Remetanea, taking three days to seize their objective. The next month, the FSSF would continue showcasing its mountain fighting expertise by taking several more Nazi positions. They'd be pulled out of the mountains to join a new Allied beachhead at Anzio, which sought to flank the German line, but they paid dearly for their time in the Italian mountains, with a whopping 77% casualty rate. 91 men lay dead, 9 were missing, 313 were wounded, and 116 had to be hospitalized for exhaustion. After a brief recovery and replenishment period, the FSSF replaced the 1st and 3rd Ranger battalions at Anzio, which had suffered heavy casualties as well. Their job was to hold the line while also launching raids into enemy territory in order to keep the Germans off balance. This is where the FSSF would earn their nickname of the Black Devils, for their propensity to launch daring night raids with completely blacked out faces. The night raids undertaken by the FSSF were so aggressive, in fact, the Germans were forced to retreat a full half mile from their original positions in order to avoid their patrols. But the very presence of the FSSF in the area led the Germans to reinforce their positions with more men than were necessary, tying down German forces desperately needed to counter Allied attacks elsewhere. The Black Devils had earned a reputation amongst the Germans who believed they were facing a full-on division rather than three understrength regiments. One note found on a German prisoner warned that they would be fighting an entire Canadian-American force. They're treacherous, unmerciful, and clever. You cannot afford to relax. The first soldier or groups of soldiers capturing one of these men will be given a 10-day furlough. With their raids penetrating deep behind enemy lines, the Germans grew increasingly more fearful of these Canadian and American night devils. To further wreak havoc on German morale, the FSSF began to leave a unique calling card on the corpses of Germans killed and equipment destroyed in the middle of the night, a sticker with the unit's patch which read in German, the worst is yet to come. That summer, the FSSF would have the honor of being one of the first Allied units to enter an enemy capital as they rushed into Rome under the cover of night in order to ensure that the retreating Germans didn't blow up key bridges. With Italy falling to the Allies, the FSSF would be shipped to the sunny southern coast of France, but they weren't there for a vacation. With the successful Allied landings at Normandy, the FSSF would help envelop German forces in France in a pincer movement. But first, the Axis had to be kicked out of the Mediterranean for good. This would require the taking of several key islands along the southern French coast, eliminating German airfields and naval facilities. Here, the FSSF would prove they could not just fight in mountains or invade from the sea, but bring victory from the sky as well as they were airdropped into the island of Pocru. The Nazis had fortified the strategically important island with 
five forts, but their naval support was quickly eliminated by a single American destroyer as it surprised two German ships defending the island. After sinking both, the USS Summers turned its attention to providing fire support for the airborne assault on the island's forts. In just one single day of fighting, the FSSF captured three of the five forts, with the other two surrendering without resistance. They suffered only nine dead for their efforts. Soon, the FSSF was joining in the invasion of southern Italy, where it fought several tough-won skirmishes against the German occupiers. As the war swung against Germany, the FSSF was moved for a well-earned rest along the French and German border to act as a blocking force and deterrent against a German breakout as the Allies pushed into Germany itself. On the 5th of December 1944, the FSSF was officially disbanded. There were no more need for its specific expertise, and both the Canadian and American military would be better served by having the men move to other units within their respective militaries. On the day of disbandment, the American troops honored their Canadian brethren with a pass in review. Eyes right, officers salute. The FSSF would be direct descendants of the U.S. Army Special Forces and laid the groundwork for training, doctrine, and tactics tactics employed by American Special Forces to this day. Every 5th of December, American and Canadian Special Forces still celebrate December 5th, along with surviving members of the FSSF. World War II is known for some of the worst atrocities committed against humanity. Many can agree that this was a dark time in our history, fueled by a ruthless ideology and a desire to promote the well-being of what was considered the superior or master Aryan race. The Aryan race included those with pure German blood, who possessed white skin, blonde hair, and blue eyes, modeled after Scandinavian people. Given the lengths the Nazis were willing to take to create a new Germany, it may seem unsurprising that they would have a program specialized for breeding human beings in accordance with their philosophy on eugenics. During the 12 years of the Third Reich, between 1933 and 1945, it's estimated that around 20,000 babies were bred by the Nazis in Germany as well as in Norway. A state-sponsored top-secret program known as Lebensborn was initiated by Heinrich Himmler. The word Lebensborn means fountain of life. It focused on increasing the birth rate of blonde, blue-eyed Aryan children through interbreeding. To do this, racially pure women were hand-selected to sleep with SS officers in the hope that they would become pregnant. So, how did Lebensborn determine which women were fit for breeding? It was a very carefully orchestrated process. First, a woman was given a series of medical examinations and had to undergo a thorough investigation into her lineage. Obviously, it was imperative that she possess no Jewish blood in her veins. She also had to make a statutory declaration that there was no trace of hereditary disease or imbecility in her family. Additionally, she had to sign a document that renounced all her claims to any children that she produced in the Lebensborn program. This is because these children would be considered the property of the state. She had to show a certificate of Aryan ancestry dating as far back as her great-grandparents. Only after given the all-clear was the woman then allowed to select a breeding partner from a chosen group of SS officers. She was encouraged to pick someone with similar hair and eye color to her own. She and her choice would then get busy. You might now be wondering who would volunteer to participate in this program. Mostly, people who strongly believed in the importance of Nazi ideals. Hildegard Trutz was one such woman. She was a loyal supporter of the Nazis since Hitler came to power. She was a member of the Bund Deutscher Mädel, otherwise known as BDM, which was basically the female equivalent of the Hitler Youth. Trutz joined the BDM in 1933 and loved it. She was quoted by HistoryExtra.com as saying, I was mad about Hitler and our new, better Germany. When she finished her schooling in 1936, she was only 18 and not sure what she wanted to do with her life. That's when a BDM leader approached her with a suggestion. He said, if you don't know what to do, why not give the Führer a child? What Germany needs more than anything is racially valuable stock. Because it was top secret, Trutz didn't know about the Lebensborn program, but she was intrigued by it, later admitting that it sounded wonderful to her. Despite knowing her parents would probably disapprove of the idea due to the stigma associated with pregnancy while not being married, Trutz signed up for the program right away. She lied to her folks while explaining that she was taking a residential course in National Socialism for a while. She probably felt flattered by the whole thing. After all, during her time with the BDM, she was singled out as a figurehead for her local organization, mainly due to her ideal Germanic appearance. She said, I was pointed out as the perfect example of the Nordic woman. For besides my long legs and my long trunk and blonde hair and blue eyes, I had the broad hips and pelvis built for childbearing. Thus, she was willing to dedicate her life to the cause by producing children for her beloved Führer, the big man himself, Adolf Hitler. 
Roots explained her experience with Lebensborn as being luxurious. She stayed in a castle in Bavaria located near the Tegensee. There were rooms for recreation, sports and games, as well as a library, music room and cinema. According to Trutz, the food was also the best she'd ever tasted. She was one among 40 other girls there at the time, and they all lived under false names. The women didn't have to work, and their needs were catered to by servants. It was a relaxing lifestyle, like a high-quality vacation. Trutz and the other girls were introduced to the SS men who were to be their breeding partners. There was a getting to know you session and the group played games, watched movies, and enjoyed social gatherings in the castle together. The women were given a week to choose which man they wanted to get down and busy with. The names of the men were not given to them though because the Liebensborn program was built on anonymity. Once the choice was made, the women had to wait until the 10th day of their menstrual cycles, from the first day of their last period. This was roughly around the time that they would be ovulating and thus most fertile. The chosen SS officers would sleep with their women for three evenings within their fertile window. On other evenings, he'd sleep with more women who had chosen him as their breeding partner. In essence, the men were like studs, prized racehorses to be used for this specific purpose. Trutz was very excited about the sexual activity and the fact that she was doing this for the cause that she so heavily believed in. She said she had no shame or inhibitions of any kind. She was impressed with her breeding partner's good looks, though she had to admit she thought he was not really the brightest bull. She even went as far as to say she thought he was kinda stupid. When Trutz fell pregnant, she was relocated into confinement in a maternity home for the next nine months. When it came time to deliver her baby, she didn't use any aids for the pain. Pain alleviation for childbirth was frowned upon, as it was something used in the, quote, degenerate western democracies, unquote. Trutz was only able to be with her baby son for two weeks while she weaned him. Then he was taken from her and she would never see him again. Trutz never discovered what happened to her son and his fate is shrouded in mystery. Nevertheless, in the years that followed, Trutz was tempted to breed more children with the program but she fell in love with an SS officer and got married. When she told her husband about her involvement with the Liebensborn program, he did not react the way she had hoped. He was not pleased with it, but at the same time, he couldn't exactly criticize her for it because she had been doing her duty to the Fuhrer. Children produced from the Liebensborn program were to be brought up in special institutions where they would be indoctrinated in Nazi ideology. They were meant to lead a glorious future in the new Germany, but Hitler and the Nazis didn't anticipate losing the war. After World War II ended, the children were heavily ostracized due to the negative stigmatization associated with their connection to the Nazis. For the ones living in Norway, being associated with Germany became a crime. For the most part, the children were alone, unprotected, and hated by the state. With literally nowhere to go, many were institutionalized. In these institutions, they were often treated very badly, scorned, and abused. This is sad when you consider that these were just children who didn't choose their fate. Nevertheless, many would spend their lives trying to distance themselves from their past association with Liebensborn and the Nazi party. It was a legacy that caused many of them to feel ashamed. Some of the lucky children who had been adopted into families were never told of where they come from, so they had no idea. A lot of Germans to this day still don't know if they were Liebensborn children, while others who do know could not obtain records that find their birth parents. Many of the records were destroyed since a lot of the fathers did not want to be found and revealed as SS men after the war. Still, even for those few who had fathers who did not try to hide their identities, the names of many parents had been stricken from record. Only a few were actually able to trace their birth parents' identities. One must wonder whether the breeding program was even worth the trouble. It's interesting that so much emphasis was directed toward creating more blonde-haired, blue-eyed children, especially when you consider that there's no scientific evidence indicating that blonde hair and blue eyes is somehow more racially valuable or has any advantage over other races. Still, you might be wondering why Liebensborn was such a tightly guarded secret during the time of the war. For the most part, the secrecy was due to the negative connotation with producing illegitimate children at the time, though Hitler had actually planned on being open about the program once the war had been won. He was, of course, overly optimistic about the outcome. So what would have happened if the Liebensborn experiment was left to continue? Well, the use of artificial selection techniques would have certainly succeeded in terms of leading to the production of many similar looking people, but more than likely they probably wouldn't have been superior to anyone else. 
The Aryan race is nothing more than a construct, and there is no defining characteristic that separates blonde-haired, blue-eyed people genetically from others. In fact, all humans, regardless of race, are very close to being genetically identical. It all seemed kind of hypocritical when you also consider that Hitler did not embody any of the criteria of the ideal race. He was short, with dark hair and brown eyes. He definitely did not fit the description of the race that he promoted. On the topic of contradictions, many SS officers also felt that the Lebensborn program did not conform to the Nazi principles of protecting good old-fashioned family values. They didn't agree with producing children for the state, thus many of them refused to participate, though they were encouraged to have at least four children each and could be fined if they didn't. The average SS household possessed one child. Aside from the breeding program, many women who were part of the Lebensborn program also joined because they were already pregnant. As well as producing children, the program was intended to discourage the abortions of Germanic Nordic babies by providing a safe, comfortable environment for single mothers to have their pregnancies and give birth in a private setting while being sheltered from outside judgment and criticism by others. The mothers were also given prenatal care and had the option of releasing their children into Nazi custody if they were unable to keep them. In order to be accepted for care within the Lebensborn program, not only did you have to resemble the ideal German race, but you also had to be carrying the child of someone who fit the physical requirements. Women had to give names of the fathers and be approved upon admission. Are there people you know of who have been scarred by the Nazi breeding program? Do you believe the Lebensborn children were unfairly treated for their Nazi connection after the war? What do you think of the parents who participated in the program? Let us know in the comments. Also, be sure to check out our other video, The Nazi's Secret Plan to Destroy British Economy. Thanks for watching and as always, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. See you next time.